How's the weekend? Pretty good, huh? There. <laughs> it should be getting better. Should, on average. I watched the uh, invitation game this weekend. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I, watched, I, watched it, I watched it when it first came out, but now it's like a fast season. I appreciate it more. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's got a lot of accuracies and a lot of inaccuracies. Though. Definitely. But they didn't play crossword puzzles. You know what they did? They wouldn't sit around and play a game with each other. No? No. Chess. Uh, yeah. So, but they couldn't make the, the stretch that chess is akin to cryptography. Crossword puzzles were akin to cryptography, <laughs> and they couldn't be more of a miss yeah. on that. Um, some of the relationships were also not well expressed. So we're talking about the movie Imitation Game that kind of um, is, a, is a fun Hollywood rendition of what happened at Bletchley Park, so back in the 1940s. So they were, they were cracking, you know, what is the Enigma code, and so the Nazi code. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of stats is involved in that. They make it all out to be math. I think they say stats once. But it really is all, like a lot of statistics that they're using. So they were doing a lot of Bayesian theory as well, where they would kind of calibrate to what are the base rates of certain words that appear in certain languages. So they had to calibrate to German rather than um, English. So that'll kind of change things. But super fascinating. Um, they make it out that Alan Turing built this machine and everybody was rivaling them. It's not true. So, Turing didn't build it, so Jack did. So Jack Good and Flowers yeah. built that. So they kind of put it together. They built 10 of them. And so they had a whole bunch of them. So there's some really interesting things that do happen in there. Um, I think that the, the part, the insight, um, where they kind of figure out what's going on and they say, there are certain snippets of words that they always use. And so they could end up just honing in on that small part of the message and search through very small things to figure out what the, you know, conversions of the code are. So, um, super interesting. I, I love that movie. They all got along. So they irritate each other at best. So a bunch of geniuses in the same room, you can imagine. So super fascinating stuff if you ever want to talk about. Yeah. I love like talking about that story. Are there books that you've read, read about it or? I, I have it. So um, I mostly, I went to Bletchley Park, I took a tour, okay. and I'd hang around and I'd talk to Jack about the whole thing. Yeah. And I was mostly interested in what his relationships were like. You know, how did the dynamic function? Because you can read the papers on everything. Simpson was hanging out there, a lot of Jack's work came out later. Um, some of the stuff that Alan Turing and Jack did together came out later. So you can read the papers. Yeah. There's usually a historical tidbit. There are a ton of articles written on this, but popular books, I, I've got to admit, so not my not my forte. Okay. So I need things to be unpopular to like <laughs> take the time. Thanks for the discussion. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to be talking about sufficient statistics. And I'm going to walk you through this extra credit assignment that I've alluded to, and then we're going to move on to the factorization theorem. The factorization theorem, I felt rather proud of myself that I knew it was good. And hopefully you guys kind of know that it's true. Something's factorizing. If we're going to consider that ratio, we'll see our example again in a moment for everything to cancel. And there only to be a constant. And so we'll prove this. It's an infinite only if theorem. Um, again, I think some of the mathematics in the proof are interesting. So there's usually a line in there that people are like, what just happened in this step of the proof? I'll try to walk you through it and provide an example. I'm going to be giving a midterm out on Friday. We do not have class on Friday. And so we'll be coming back on Wednesday. What is Wednesday? Spring break. Spring break. Oh. So March 17th is spring break. So we'll be coming back on another Friday. What I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you two lectures. So after Wednesday's class, depending on where we're at, I'm just going to run another lecture for two hours and I'm going to post that video probably on Thursday, Wednesday night, something like that. Then I'm going to email out to everybody on the class list your midterm. And you're going to have one week to do this. 
So you'll come back on that next Friday and you'll have turned this in electronically. If you'd like to turn it in by hand in paper, that's fine too. So that'll work. So this will be due either electronically or in person. And this will be due on the 19. So there's no class here. And what works if you want to turn it in and it's you have to be late one day. Yeah, you have to be late one day. So that's true. Yeah, we said that. Uncle had a good insight last week to ask about that. So you'll just turn it in that one day late. One day? One week. Uh, you'll turn it in at the next class. Yeah, one week. Uh huh, that's right. So, no in person class here. I can, I can cut it out on Slack, so, but it's exactly what you think it is. So, exactly what Anker thinks it is, exactly what Danielle thinks it is. You always turn in the next time. So that's what my rules, they always go in your favor. So just remember that. So, um, no in-person classes um, until, I'll say, no in-person classes from 12, through the 17th. The 17th is spring break. And I don't have to get worried about being pinched because I only have one green shirt. So I'll probably forget to wear it. Um, on, that's, that is St. Patrick's Day. So any reason to celebrate is a good reason. So even if it's for five minutes. Okay. Let's carry on unless there's any logistic questions. Perfect. Oh, wait. Uh, is there a review session on Thursday? Mohammed will carry it. Yeah. So if you'll jump online and do your review session, I'll come back on to the, the next Thursday. So we'll do on, we'll start doing the flip again. So again, review sessions back in order on Thursdays, 5.30, and we'll kind of rotate. Mohammed's up next. I'll take the next one. So, okay. Um, we were studying this example, and I wanted to say a few things about what Experimenter 2 is going to do in this case. So Experimenter 1 gets to see all of the data. So Experimenter 1 sees this. So the XIs that Experimenter 1 observes are stochastic, they're random. And, they, and Experimenter 1 will account for that randomness. That randomness controls this thing. If you see the XIs, you can compute that with certainty. So whatever the XIs that come out of this, I get them, they're random, but then I can compute this and there's no randomness anymore. Um, so in the presence of this and accounting for this randomness, there's no randomness here. If I didn't observe this, then of course this is acting like a random variable to you. So, and all the randomness is controlled through the XIs. And so we'll see that a little bit more when we do factorization theorem, is what does it mean to transform a random variable? So we want to look at this ratio right here. So to verify everything that X bar is sufficient, we look at this ratio. F of X given, in our case, mu, and F of some of the XIs over N. So I'll say X bar N given mu. And we want to show that this is a constant. And so, and that will verify that X bar is sufficient. Now there's a little bit of a, a hassle with this is that in order to use this definition to show that this thing is a constant, we'll show this in a second, we need to know the sufficient statistic up front. And so it's a tool for verifying that sufficient statistic is sufficient. But it doesn't provide much insight on how to recognize a sufficient statistic. 
And that's what the factorization theorem will do for us. Okay, so I'll just say this and then we'll prove it. That when I'm looking for a sufficient statistic, what I really look for is the part of the data that I can't factorize away from the parameter. So if there's a chunk that I can never get rid of and I want to somehow reduce it probably to its minimal form, um, that's minimal sufficiency. We'll get into that in the next class. But if there's a part you can't factorize away from the parameter, that's the sufficient statistic. And that's what's going on. And that's how you recognize that. So let's just write this out one more time. So this thing is going to be product. I goes from 1 to n. This is the numerator. And then I have these little sampling densities. F, X, I, given mu. F, X, I, given mu, that's just a normal distribution. So 1 over root 2 pi. You're probably starting to get the hang of it that these constants right here don't have much to do with the inference. They don't help us to recognize anything. E to the minus 1 half Xi minus mu squared over sigma squared. And then we have the sampling distribution for X bar. It's also normally distributed. It's not even an asymptotic thing because the original Xi's were normal. And so this is just going to look like 1 over square root 2 pi sigma squared over n e to the minus 1 half x bar minus mu squared over sigma squared over n. And I'm sure you've shown this many times that the sampling distribution of x bar is normally distributed and the only thing that happens is it rescales the variance. I use that all the time. So quite often I just jump to what the distribution of sufficient stats are. And I just invoke those in practice. Okay, let's just write out what this is. It simplifies a lot. I like to look at the little chunks. So this is just going to be 2 pi sigma squared right down minus n over 2 e to the minus one half sum i goes from one to n x i's minus mu i'm going to leave a little bit of room in here divided by sigma squared and then i've got this thing on the bottom still two pi sigma squared over n this is raised to the minus half power you can do some cancellation in here if you want i'm just going to leave it as is so you can see where all the pieces come from. E to the minus one half x bar minus mu squared over sigma squared over n. I'll be polite and put that in braces. Um, what we did last time is we subtracted and added an x bar. And so what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to say plus x bar, let's say minus x bar right there plus x bar, and then my minus sign goes right there. So this is just the x bar n that we had before. Oftentimes I subscript that with n, because when I'm taking limits, I want to remember there's an n in there. So it really is just superfluous notation right here. You don't need to worry about it. So we're just going to block those together and expand this square. And so at least this part, I'm just going to write it down so I don't have to use up too much of the board. This whole thing right here just expanding is going to be x bar, I'll say x size minus x bar and squared plus 2 times x i minus x bar x bar n minus mu so the 
cross term plus x bar and minus mu squared. That's what the terms look like. As I run the sum over everything, I'm going to get the sum of the xi's minus x bar, and the cross term is going to cancel. So I'll be a little bit impolite and just say that this goes to zero through the sum. So I'm going to just drop the term. Probably should drop it after I roll the sum through, but I think you can interpolate that step. So this whole thing simplifies to 2 pi sigma squared minus n over 2 e. And I'm going to do my factorization all in one step since we did it last time in class. This is e to the minus 1 half sum of the xi's minus x bar squared. i goes from 1 to n. This is going to be over sigma squared. e to the minus 1 half. And I'm just left with this last piece. Once I roll the sum through, there's an extra n that comes upstairs, x bar, n minus mu squared over sigma squared. In, in the denominator, we have the same thing. I'll write it over here. E to the minus one half x bar n minus mu squared sigma squared over n. So I wrote this down a little bit differently here, but this thing is that thing right there. And they're going to cancel each other in this equation. And so this is what I'm going to allude to when I talk about the factorization theorem, is that there's a factor, if this thing is going to be constant, that contains all of my parameters of interest. The parameter of interest is only me when it shows up there, and they're going to cancel each other. So my infinite wisdom back in graduate school told me this was going to happen. Okay. Um, on the denominator, can it be 2 pi sigma square over n? Yes. The trouble with knowing all the answers is you end up writing down the thing that um, doesn't matter wrong every <laughs> single time. So, thank you. So, those are going to cancel each other. They factorize out. Um, last time, Peter said that this thing right here was going to be sufficient for sigma squared. Right. So why is that true? We'll see in the factorization theorem. It's because I can't untangle it from sigma squared. And so, and I guess a lot of us have a lot of intuition that this is how the data comes in when we estimate um, sigma squared. You always use the sum of squared errors. You might divide by n or you might divide by n minus 1, depending on which properties you want. But the important thing is, is that you use some of the squared pairs. Okay, I think we all know that. This stuff is not going to be super important to us, but it does show up. It turns out to be the normalizing constant for some distributions. This distribution at the end of the day, um, I'll just write down what we just did. So this thing is equivalent to writing down f of x given p of x. There was a mu in here, but it ended up canceling out. So, because this thing is sufficient, there's no mu there. It's constant with respect to mu. So when I say it's a constant, I mean with respect to the parameter that the sufficient statistic is sufficient for. Right there. Uh, the arrow is on the numerator or the whole ratio? What's that? Uh, this is equivalent to the numerator. Yes, this is equivalent to that. To the, yeah, or oh, the ratio, all of it. Yes, that thing. Like the ratio. Like the ratio. I mean? This is that. That's a ratio. Yeah, the whole ratio, not only numerator. Yes, that's right. Okay. The ratio. That's right. This is that. 
T of x is x bar. You got it. T of x is x bar. So, computing a few things from last time's class. So that is the sufficient statistic. In the book, their sufficient stats are always T. If they use S for their ancillary stats. So we'll stick with that. Okay. So, why is that true? I'll just recap since that wasn't 1,000% clear. What is this ratio right here, F of X? Given mu over f of tx, which is x bar in our case, over mu, this ratio right here is the same as this. I didn't change anything. All the stochasticity is driven by the xi's. And so if you wanted to write this thing down, what this joint distribution is, these two things would factorize, and I would have a point mass on x bar because there's no randomness given that I know the x size. So they're the exact same thing. So no extra information, and I'll write that down. No extra info. And so this ratio is f of x given t of x And I'll write in my mu right here, F T of X. Well, I'll just write it out like this. I don't think it, I don't think it's necessary to do this extra step right here. But this thing is going to be F of X given T of X and mu. If I'm doing this all very algebraically. This is what this thing would be. I've got the joint distribution. I divide by its margin. I'm conditioning on mu in both of them, so I need to condition on mu over here. So that one you can take to the bank. So this is always going to be true regardless of what t of x is. But if t of x is sufficient, then there's no dependency on the parameter. We just verify that. And so this is a conditional distribution. So f of x given t of x. And so in our case, for our problem, that just looks like this. 1 over, we write it like this, 2 pi sigma squared minus 10 over 2 over 2 pi sigma squared over n to the minus 1 half, e to the minus 1 half, sum of the x i's minus x bar squared over sigma squared. So that is what this conditional distribution is. In our proof that we studied, this is the thing that they're saying experimenter 2 can sample from this. And they can create a new vector of data. So I will write down um, that we have a constraint on this. Note that the sum of the xi's out of this distribution must be equal to n times x bar. Or they have to have the exact same means. This equality is strict right here. So you have to adhere to that. So experimenter 2 can sample from this distribution, they say. And it looks like a tall order to sample from this distribution. It kind of looks like a normal distribution, but it is not normal. Usually in a normal distribution, that would be a mu sitting right there. And the sum of the xi's don't have to sum to exactly mu. If I had very, very large xi's, a whole bunch of them, n was very big in a normal distribution, then if I took that um, average, it would be very close to mu. I think I said sum, replace that with average. So it would be close to mu, but never exactly mu. In this distribution, we need to sample these xi's that kind of look Gaussian. How do I know that they kind of look Gaussian? Because it's e to the minus a quadratic form. So whenever I see e to the minus quadratic form, that's a Gaussian, or at least proportional to a Gaussian. There's no other distribution that looks like that. So that's the canonical relationship between mu, um, its parameters, and the data. 
But this distribution is different. It's not Gaussian because everything has to sum x bar. And so how would poor experimenter 2 go about doing this? Luckily, experimenter 2 doesn't need to. It can just work with the distribution of the sufficient statistic and do the same inference on mu. But just to follow that proof that we were talking about, it is an interesting question is, how do you actually sample from this? So in class, I said last time, I don't really care about that proof so much. I just think it's interesting that the likelihood functions have the same shapes effectively. And that tells me that everything is sufficient. That's the way I see the problem. That's the way I would explain it to somebody. Um, but it's still mathematically interesting, although a bit nuanced, how they go about it to experimenters to see different things where they can prove that they have the same information. And the way they did that is they said experimenter two is going to sample a collection of XIs from this distribution. They're going to be different XIs than experimenter one holds, but they're going to have all the same info about mu. And so we would need a sampling scheme to sample from this. And it would be very, very difficult to do. So um, heavy constraint on all of this. You might say, maybe I'll do something like really heuristic, and I wonder if it works, that I'll just sample a bunch of XIs from a normal distribution. I'll get n minus 1 of them. And then I'll pick the last one to be the thing that makes the sum adhere to the constraint. That's going to be a bogus sampling scheme. So, because those XIs can't just be anything. So, they're all compressed in some area. This parameter right here is still showing us that all of these are relatively close to each other, the XIs. Relatively close with respect to sigma squared. So, how do we sample from that? I'm going to put this down as part of our extra credit assignment, but let me just take a moment to talk about um, that MCMC extra credit assignment that you all have been licking your chops and wanting to get at. So I'll discuss how to do MCMC to sample from this distribution third. Let me show you um, the extra credit assignment all the way through. So extra credit. You don't have to do this if you don't want. And I am not going to write down a formal write-up for this problem. This is it. So, if you need more than this, office hours, Mohammed probably could help you. I could tell you a few things about it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. So, saying that, this is the most relevant algorithm that you're going to come across in the next couple of years of your life. So, it's relevant, it's nice, everybody uses it these days. They'll become Bayesians just to use this. You don't have to use it in a Bayesian context, though. This problem has nothing to do with Bayes. So you can use it for any general sampling problem. Um, that's what's nice about MCMC. It's a little bit time consuming. You can speed it up using computational tricks. But what's nice about it is how general it is, and I can apply it anywhere. So extra credit. So I'll say there's three parts. So problem from the book. We're going to adapt A to use a local proposal. I'll explain what that means in a second. And then C, we're going to do this problem right here. Sample from this. So let me just write down what the trouble is tasting. They talk about it in the book. They tell you what the algo is real quickly. They don't prove anything to you. They just say it works. We're going to stick with that. If you do need a proof, if you're dying, you're losing sleep over it, come and see me, and we'll walk through it. I need to teach you a couple weeks' worth of Markov chain theory before we can do that. Otherwise, wait for maybe my Bayes class I explain it, or an MCMC class. OK, so here's the algorithm. So Metropolis Hastings. Very useful tool, very interesting mathematics as to why it works. But what you do is you, you just tell you what our goal is. Goal is 
sample from F. Some distribution, I'm just going to talk about it very generally. So F of X. I want to get samples from this distribution. I'll fill in what these are, what the notation is for all of these different sub-problems. I'll also say, I'll give you 5% midterm credit for this problem. I'll give you 5% midterm credit if you do this part, and I'll give you another 5% midterm credit if you do this part. Is it possible to get 300% in my class? Maybe. So, probably 150% if I give you enough extra credit assignments. So, plenty of opportunities in this class to make up for any points that Mohammed's taken away from you. Well, let me finish writing out what the algorithm is. This is going to look like this. Step zero is you're going to initialize. So this is always an initialization step. You've got to start iterative algorithms somewhere. So I'm just going to take x, and the way I'm going to write it out is this could be a vector, it could be a matrix, it could be a collection of random variables, it could be a single, it could be a scalar as well. So it could be anything you want to think about that's random. So initialize. I'm going to take x0, and I'm going to set it equal to something. Some good starting point. So I said some good starting point. If you know about your problem, um, you want it to run fast, you pick something in the stationary distribution if you happen to know what it is. Um, for real practicalities, you always want to start with a horrible starting point and make sure that you also converge. And so you want to make sure your code is robust enough to handle all cases. So because usually you do start off in some really weird part of the space. You have no idea what the association between all the parameters are. And then there's just two more steps that I'm going to iterate over. 4t goes from 1 to some large number, something big. How big is big? My answer is always going to be the same, so that it's converged. And I'll give you a diagnostic for that, or at least something you can look up. So big. So, like um, 1 billion. Okay, I don't run all my samplers for a million iterations, but you get the point. If you say 100, it's going to freak me out. So, 100 probably isn't even enough samples from the stationary distribution if you get there. So, two steps. Step one is proposed. So I'm going to get a draw from some distribution right here. And this is the whole name of the game at MCMC, is to pick this distribution well. How do you do it? Depends on what F is in the context of the problem. Multimodal problems will certainly get a different proposal than unimodal problems. Luckily, all the problems we're going to study right here are unimodal, so they don't have peaks everywhere. So some proposal. Should we take the, the G of the book, which was, I think, T? Right. So that's going to be problem A. I'm writing it down generally. So we'll write it down generally, and then we'll fill in what G and F are. So pro proposed. Something good. What's good uh, depends on the problem. If it's a hard problem and you come up with a good solution, you get a publication out of it. Fame and fortune, I've been told, will ensue. Still waiting. In the meantime, I'll, I'll slum it with you guys. So I do this, I come up with G's all the time. So it's like another G for another problem. Then I prove mathematically the things are fast, and then I demonstrate it, and then I show what the answer to some hard problem is. So then you end up computing an acceptance. So I'm going to 
choose to accept. So the acceptance probability. I'll, I'll say that this rule is the decision. So I'm going to decide. So I'm going to write down an acceptance probability. This is going to be the min between 1, f, x, star, that's my proposal, divided by f of x, where I was last time. We've initialized all of this. So it should run g, x star, g, x, t minus 1. And then I'm going to update accordingly. So my next value, x, t, is going to either be x star or it's going to be x, t minus 1. So I'm either going to move to my proposed location or I'm going to stay where I am. And staying where you are is very important. You don't throw anything away in this algorithm. So this happens with probability alpha, and this happens with probability 1 minus alpha. So this is just a Bernoulli coin flip with probability alpha. So I compute this thing, the probability, then I flip a coin. If it's a 1, I sample that, I propose. If it's a 0, I stay where I'm at. And I store all those draws. OK. Um, how do I know I converge? In 1B, this is very easy to do. You look at something called a trace plot. And what that trace plot is, it looks like this right here, where this is going to be my iterations. So this is going to go from 0 to cap t. So I'll just start with my initial value. And this is going to be my draws, samples. So let's say that f was over here. Let's say that was what f looked like. It's this distribution. Usually I take distributions and I draw them on the axis tilted 90 degrees. I'm just going to draw like here. So my first sample is going to be my x0. So this right here is going to be x0 right here. It's going to be some value. That's my starting point. So what I've done in this is I've, I've drawn a picture such that my starting point is way off in the tail of this distribution. So I'm imagining this tail is really thin down here. And so what you're going to do is you're going to propose values, and then you're going to decide whether you stay at the same location or you move. Let's imagine that I proposed something that was really far away from my target distribution. I ended up staying in the same location. So I flip my coin, and it tells me, stay. So this would look like a little plateau. So this would be my first iteration. And I ended up staying. Then maybe I sample something else. I do this iteration one more time. I propose a new value. And let's say I flip my Bernoulli coin after I compute the acceptance probability, and it tells me to move. So my second iteration, I ended up moving right here. I'm going to give myself a little bit of room you can think about this. So I'm going to kind of have this be very, very far out into here, just so I have enough room to actually draw. So I have that, then I move, then maybe I move down, maybe I move up, maybe I move there, maybe I move there. Maybe I stick again. And after a while, this thing is going to make its way all the way up here. So it's going to be kind of moving around. And then finally, I get here. And once I get here, I end up sampling very nicely from this distribution. What I'm drawing right here is these samples are going to line up with where the mass of the distribution is probably should look more like this. I'm a pretty bad artist. But if you'd like to look this up, I'm sure you can read about it, since this is extra credit, and you can look at what a trace plot is. What you usually do is you get rid of this stuff. So you chop this out. This is called your burn-in period. 
It's non-stationary. We haven't hit the right distribution. So what you're looking for when you get all these samples, at the end of the day, this results in a very long collection of random samples. You look at those random samples and you make sure that they're not trending in some sort of direction. That eventually you're sampling from the same thing over and over again. So here's a fact that if F has the same support as is G has the same support of F, they live in the same spaces, this algorithm will eventually converge to sampling from F. Once it converges, it stays converged. If it unconverges, that only means one thing. You have an error in your code. So you coded it up wrong. So you'll plot this, and then at the end of the day, you take these samples right here, and you're going to plot a histogram of them. So I can plot this histogram of all these samples. And lo and behold, these samples will look like that distribution right here. That. So Metropolis is cool because it eventually converges, even if you have a, a bad F, not an ill-conforming F, not one that, or sorry, a bad G. If you have a G that doesn't sit in the same support as F, it will never converge. So, um, if you have a G that doesn't place mass where F lives, I should say, it will not converge. So, here's problem A. So from the book, this is really easy. Problem A is the easiest one. What you're going to do is F of x and g of x, this is going to be t distribution 1 plus x minus, I guess this is going to be a 0 right here, squared over new degrees of freedom. There's going to be a 1 in here. That's by standard deviation for the problem minus mu plus 1 over 2. That's the degrees of freedom. I wrote down proportionality because in the ratio all the normalizing constants will cancel each other. So this is a T with new degrees of freedom. And they suggest a proposal that looks like a normal distribution. E to the minus 1 half X minus 0 squared over 1 squared. So this is a normal. This actually won't work. So if I ended up making new 1, this thing won't work at all. If I make new like 4, it will work. So it all depends on how much mass is in those tails. So a T1 distribution, also known as a Cauchy distribution, is very fat tailed. The reason this won't work is because when you propose from a normal, you'll never reach those tails. You'll never reach far enough into the tails. It'll take you forever to do. Um, you'll never see those samples that are a thousand standard deviations out. But for a Cauchy, you'll see things that are that far off. It wouldn't be a standard deviation because it doesn't exist for a Cauchy. OK, problem two, B. So what you'll do is you'll end up documenting what you did, write a paragraph about the problem setup, show me a trace plot, and then show me a history. B, same problem, F, X, proportional to 1 plus X star. I'll just suppress the notation. So same target. And G, I'm going to make a little bit different. I'm going to say G is going to be centered if where I was last time. And this is going to look like this. E to the minus 1 half x star, or I'll say, if you have like, I'll just put the x in there. Minus xt minus 1 squared over psi squared. And this is going to be a tuning parameter. And you'll tune that. And it controls how far we want our proposed samples. So if you'd like this to be a star right here just to match the notation, that's fine. We could do that. 
But this is going to tune to see how far from our previous draw are you willing to move. If you make that really small, your trace plots will look like this. So psi squared too small. This is going to be your trace plot. It's going to look like this. It's going to snake around. And that's because your proposal barely ever wants to move anywhere. It's just tiptoeing through the space. It will eventually converge, but you'll need a lot of samples for this thing to converge. If size is too big, your tree plots will look like this. It'll take a long time for this thing to converge. So what's happening is if size is too big, you're always shooting way too far into the tail for the distribution. So you're always stuck and you'll always reject the move so you'll stay at the same location. And so, what's the right side to pick? The one that makes it look like this, fuzzy. So what that means is that your proposal is able to jump you around the space that you're trying to sample from fast enough. So, a little bit of a hindrance there because it's hard to find the optimal. In this problem, there is an answer for the optimal, but in general problems, it's totally unclear. So you just want something that's good. Steven. So is there, is it all visual to know if it converges, or is there a secret formula that? There are secret formulas that are not guaranteed. Okay. So there's something called like the, um, the GYE test. There's also the gelman rubin Brooks test class of things. They're glamorized ANOVA to see if that distribution is converged. So um, it looks like you're comparing means and a whole bunch of blocks of distribution. Uh, okay, yeah. And um, you have to correct the ANOVA forms to account for dependency in the samples. So I think that's OK stuff. And I say that I computed that, and oftentimes I do, but it just satisfies people that are a little bit skeptical. So I think for the most part what you do is you visually inspect them all and then maybe you run your diagnostics. But as you're debugging it, you probably are visually doing it. Um, in high dimensions, this is hard because you have to track every dimension of the problem. So maybe you take a norm or something in high dimensions and you track that and you make sure that things converge. Not a guarantee of convergence, but at least a proxy for convergence. And that's the best we can ever do. Problem C is harder to do this. So to sample from this problem, you need a G that's good in how you do it. So the G needs to always have the XIs in the right place, or at least close to the right place. So here's what I would do, and I'm just going to write this down. And again, if this is something you don't feel like coding up, or thinking about too much, you don't have to do it. But here's my choice. This is an easy choice. So what I would do is I might make x0 my first sample. Now remember, this is going to be an n vector. So I'll say x0, n vector. So every time I sample from this distribution, I've got n of these xi's right here. So every sample is a vector. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize it. And what am I going to initialize everything to be? x bar. So this is my actual sample. So experimenter 1 gets to see x bar. So experimenter 2 is going to initialize their code with x bar all the way across. The nice thing about this is the sum of all of these meets my constraint. So the sum of everything is the sum of the xi's. So I'm already satisfied. Here's what I'm going to do for gx. And I'm going to have this conditioned 
on where I was last time, t minus 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take two indices right here. So I'll say this is maybe the i and j position. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add epsilon and I'm going to subtract epsilon to everything. So I'm going to reach into this vector in the i and j location, and then I'm going to generate some random error where my epsilons are normally distributed. I'll center them at zero, and I'll put in this tuning parameter. So this will say how far I want to deviate. So I'm going to grab for my last vector that meets my constraint two positions, and I'm going to add and subtract x bar epsilon, which is stochastic. Now I'm going to count for that stochastic error in G just through that normal draw. I only draw one random thing, and I add and subtract it. What did I just do? I kept the constraint satisfied. And so that new vector has the right constraint built into it. Now you could do all kinds of fancy things. You could say, I don't want to update just two elements in the vector. I want to, element, I want to update a whole bunch of them. But that might be too ambitious. And so there's this balance between moving too much and moving too little. And we have to grapple with that balance in our daily lives. So how much do we actually move? So if you want to talk more about this, that's fine. I'm going to give you until the end of class. So at the final, you can turn in all your extra credit. If you'd like to deliver it to me along the way, that's fine too. So, Lots of time to do this, lots of review sessions for discussion, um, but that's it for now. Next time we're going to come in, finish up the factorization theorem. I'll probably include for your two auxiliary lectures for when I'm away for a couple days next week. I'm going to go through minimal sufficiency, I think. And so that's pretty well outlined in the book as well. So you probably don't need too much guidance for it, but I'll augment everything, we'll do the factorization theorem, then we'll do minimal sufficiency, then I'll see you guys again in a week. So, from Friday. Cool. Thanks, you guys.